Hi, and welcome to the first video for Physical Chemistry 1. In today's video, I want to tell you about how we found out one of the most interesting facts we know about the world. It turns out that the Earth was formed about 4.4 billion years ago. That's a fact you've probably heard in other classes, and maybe even before you were in high school. But how do we know that? And more important for us, what's it got to do with chemistry? It turns out that, in order to understand the age of the Earth, we need to understand some of the same ideas we talked about in the last lecture. In that class, we talked about rate laws, and we saw that a rate law is an equation that tells us how the rate of a chemical reaction is connected to the concentrations of the reactants. We saw that every chemical reaction has its own rate law, and they all have the same format. Rate equals K, the rate law constant, times the concentration of each reactant each raised to a power, which is usually an integer. Let's try an example using a real chemical reaction instead of a generic one. Suppose we combine mercury 2 chloride and an oxalate ion, which produces chloride ion, carbon dioxide, and mercury 1 chloride. Let's figure out the rate law for this reaction. We can start out by writing as much of the rate law as we can so far. Remember, a rate law always has the same basic format. We have rate equals K times the concentration of each reactant, each raised to a different exponent. In this example, our reactants are mercury 2 chloride and oxalate. The main thing we need to do is to determine the exponents, and in order to do that, we need data. So, here's some data for this reaction. If we compare the first two trials, you can see that the concentration of mercury 2 chloride changes and the oxalate stays the same. So the oxalate is our control. If we take the ratio of trial 1 to trial 2, we get a ratio of 2 for the rates and a ratio of 2 for the concentrations. That makes the exponent 1 for the mercury 2 chloride. To get the exponent for the oxalate, we need to compare two trials where the mercury 2 chloride is the control. So we'll compare trials 1 and 3. If we take the ratio of the rates, we get 9. And the ratio of the concentrations is 3. That means our exponent for oxalate will be 2. So that gives us our rate law. We use 1 for the exponent on mercury 2 chloride and 2 for the exponent on oxalate. Now that we know the rate law, we can also determine the value of k, the rate law constant. Just as in our earlier example, we use the data from one of our trials. We can choose any of the three trials because they'll all give us the same result for k. I'll use the data from trial 1. When we plug in the rate and the values for the concentrations, we can solve for k and get 8.73 times 10 to the minus 3 and then the units are molarity to the minus 2 times seconds to the minus 1. Again, be careful when you calculate the units for K. They won't always be the same for every reaction. Now that we know K, we can determine the rate of this reaction for any starting concentrations. For example, suppose we started with a concentration of 0 0.200 molar for both of the reactants. What would be the reaction rate? Because of all the work we just did, it'll be easy to calculate this. We use 0 0.200 molar for the concentrations and the value of K we just determined. That will give us a rate of 6.98 times 10 to the minus 5 molars per second. There's one more very important thing to know about the rate law. As we'll see in the next few videos, the exponents in the rate law are especially useful bits of information. The exponents are called the reaction order. For example, in the reaction we just looked at, we found out that the reaction is first order with respect to mercury 2 chloride, and second order with respect to oxalate. Also, if we add the exponents together, we get what's called the overall reaction order. So this reaction is third order overall. In the generic reaction we looked at earlier, we can see that the reaction is second order with respect to A, first order with respect to B, and zeroth order with respect to C. If we add the exponents, we find out that it's third order overall. 
So, what's so important about the reaction order? It turns out that if you know the reaction order, you can find out a lot about a reaction. That's because all reactions with the same order are a lot alike in some important ways. So, for example, all first-order reactions have similar kinetic behavior, and so do all second-order reactions, and so on. So, if you know the reaction order, you can make predictions about how long the reaction will take and how much product you'll have after a given amount of time. Information like that is extremely useful when you want to know whether a reaction is fast enough or slow enough to be useful, or how long it'll take for the reaction to give you the amount of product you want. For that reason, we'll spend the next few videos finding out what we can learn just by knowing the reaction order. This is a big topic, and the reaction order is something that chemists spend a lot of time finding out whenever they develop a new chemical reaction, so the ideas you're learning about here are good practical knowledge. It turns out that a vast majority of all chemical reactions are either first order or second order, which means that the exponents are either 1 or 2. And, as I mentioned earlier, all chemical reactions with the same reaction order have some important things in common. So, in this video, we'll just talk about first-order reactions. Suppose we have a very simple reaction like this, in which there's one reactant and it forms one product. If it's a first-order reaction, what will be the rate law? From our previous discussion, you know that the rate law will be rate equals k times the concentration of each reactant raised to an exponent. Since this reaction only has one reactant, that means A will be the only reactant in the rate law. Also, since we know it's a first-order reaction, we know the exponent is 1. Since A to the first power is just equal to A, I'll stop writing the exponent from here on out. This is a good time to ask the question, what's a rate law for? What good does it do us to know it? Well, one of the useful things we might want to know about a reaction is, how long will it take? For example, if we perform a reaction and we let it continue for one hour, how much product will we get? Or if we need a certain amount of product, how long will it take the reaction to make it? It turns out that we can use the rate law to answer those questions, but first we need to perform a little math in order to rewrite this rate law to get an equation that ties together the concentration and the time. To do that, we need to use calculus. In this course, we'll often use what you've learned in your calculus courses to make predictions about how chemical systems behave, so this is the first of many times that we'll use calc. We'll start with the rate law for a first order reaction, like this one. Since there's only one reactant, the rate law must be rate equals k times the concentration of A. Let's put in the definition for the rate that we learned in class. The rate is the change in the concentration of A over the change in time. Also, remember that because A is a reactant, that means its concentration is decreasing, so delta A is a negative number. That means we need a negative sign in front of the rate. Now is where the calculus comes in. The symbol delta means that the concentration and time are changing by finite measurable amounts. As you know from your calculus class, we can shrink the changes in time and concentration so that they're infinitely tiny. If we do that, we don't use the symbol delta anymore. Instead, what we're doing is taking a derivative, so we use dA and dt. Our next step is to get the concentration and time on opposite sides of the equal sign. We'll do that by multiplying both sides by dt, so that time is now on the right side of the equation. Next, we'll divide both sides by the concentration of A, so now all the terms with concentration are on the left, and all the terms with time are on the right. What we just did in order to make that happen is a technique called separation of variables. It's a very common method we use in mathematics, physics, and chemistry when we have an equation with more than one variable and we want to find out how the variables affect each other. We'll perform separation of variables on quite a few different equations during this course, so it's a good technique to have in your toolkit. Our last job is to get rid of the derivatives. From your calculus courses, you know that we do this by integrating the equation. We integrate each side of the equation separately. 
I'll do the right side first because it's a little easier. On the right, we have k times dt, so we'll integrate that. The first thing we need to do is think about what the limits of the integral are. Since the variable we're integrating over is t, our limits are the beginning and ending times. The chemical reaction we're looking at starts at time 0, and it keeps going until some later time called t, so those will be the lower and upper limits. Now we can solve the integral. k is a constant, so we can pop it out of the integral, and that means our integral is just the integral of dt. From calculus, you should know that the solution of this integral is just t. We apply the upper and lower limits to this, which gives us t minus 0, or just t. That gives us a value of kt for the right side of our equation. If you didn't know the solution to that integral, you might want to check the integral table in your old calculus book. I'll also give you a table of integrals that you can use in class, and I'll post a copy of it on our website for the course. That integral table will be useful many times during our class, including in a moment when we solve the integral on the left side of the equation. Let's do that now. The limits for this integral will be the concentration at the beginning of the reaction and at a later time called t. Let's call the initial concentration a0, since it's the concentration at time 0 and the ending concentration is at. Now we solve the integral. From the table of integrals, and maybe from your memory of the calculus course you took, we can see that the solution to this integral is the natural logarithm of a. Don't forget, there's also a negative sign out in front of the integral. So we have the negative of the natural log of at minus the natural log of a0. If you've worked with logarithms before, you might know that when we subtract one logarithm from another, we get the logarithm of the first number divided by the second. Also, let's get rid of that negative sign. It turns out that when you change the sign on a logarithm, you must take the reciprocal of the number you're taking the log of. So we end up with the log of a0 over at on the left side of the equation. And on the right side is the solution to the integral we solved earlier, which was k times t. And that's it. This equation ties together the beginning and ending concentrations and the amount of time that's passed. We'll use this equation in just a moment, but before we do that, I want to remind you a bit about what the natural logarithm means. The natural log of x is the number we'd have to raise e to in order to get x. So, for example, the logarithm of 100 is 4.6052. What that means is that if we take e and raise it to the power 4.6052, we get 100. If you have a scientific calculator, you should have a button on it that allows you to take the logarithm. Notice that there's also a button that says log on it. This is a different type of logarithm and would give you a different result. Be careful to use ln, the button for natural logarithm, and not the button that says log. So let's get back to our equation for first order reactions and see how we use logarithms in it. Suppose we have this reaction, which is a first order reaction with a rate constant of 4.80 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds to the minus 1. The concentration of the reactant, dinitrogen pentoxide, starts out at 1.65 times 10 to the minus 2 molar. How long will it take for the concentration to decrease to 1.00 times 10 to the minus 2? We have this equation for first order reactions. We're looking for t, the time the reaction will take, and we have everything else we need for the concentration. We'll plug our values into the equation. The first thing we should do is solve the logarithm. One thing that's important to know is that we should not take the logarithm for each part of the fraction and then divide them. Instead, we should divide the two concentrations in the fraction first and then take the logarithm. So the fraction gives us 1.65. We take the logarithm, which gives us 0 0.5008. And now we'll solve for t, which gives us 1,043 seconds. Let's try another problem. Suppose we perform the same reaction, 
and still starting with a concentration of 1.65 times 10 to the minus 2 molars. What will be the concentration after the reaction has been going for 15 minutes? We used the same equation as last time, but this time our unknown isn't t. We know the amount of time that's gone by. Instead, our unknown is the final concentration, which is down in the denominator. We'll plug the rest of our data into the equation. Remember, our value for the rate constant includes seconds as part of its unit, so we have to convert the time into seconds as well. On the right side, we multiply our two numbers to get 0 0.432. But what about the left side? We can't just multiply both sides by the denominator, because the logarithm affects the whole fraction. Instead, we have to get rid of the logarithm first. Fortunately, there is a way we can do that. Remember, the logarithm of x is the number we need to raise e to in order to get x. So, this fraction is equal to e to the 0 0.432 power. This is a technique you can use whenever you have a logarithm in an equation and you need to get rid of it. If the logarithm is the only thing on one side of the equal sign, you can remove the logarithm by raising e to the power of what's ever on the other side of the equal sign. If we solve the right side of this equation, we get 1.54. Now we can solve for the final concentration, which turns out to be 1.07 times 10 to the minus 2 molar. There's another useful property of first order reactions you've probably heard of, the half-life. The half-life of a chemical reaction is the amount of time it takes for half of the reactants to react. Let's start by thinking about the equation we got for our first order reactions. I just mentioned that at the half-life, half of the reactants have been used up, so the concentration of reactant will be half of the original concentration. So we'll put that down here in the denominator. If you look carefully at this fraction, you'll see that the concentrations will cancel out. So the left side of the equation is just the logarithm of 2. The time at which this happens is the half-life, so we'll put a little subscript 1 half on the t to remind us about that. This is a useful equation. If we know the half-life, k is easy to get, and vice versa. Let's try an example. In the previous problem, where we were working with dinitrogen pentoxide, what was the half-life of this reaction? All we need to know is the rate constant, and that was given in the previous problem. It was 4.80 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds to the minus 1. If we use that in this equation and solve for the half-life, that gives us 1,444 seconds. So, what does that tell us about the reaction? After 1,444 seconds, half of the reactants will be gone, and there's an interesting consequence of that. Suppose we started off with a 10 molar concentration. After 1,444 seconds, half of it would be gone, so we'd have a 5 molar concentration. But what about 1,444 seconds after that? The concentration wouldn't go all the way down to zero. Instead, it would be half of what was left so we'd have 2.5 molars of reactant left. After another 1,444 seconds, we'd have 1.25 molars, and after 1,444 more seconds after that, it would be down to 0.625 molar. Every time a half-life goes by, the concentration decreases by half. Let's try one more example that'll tie together everything that we've looked at today. Suppose we have a first-order reaction in which we start with a concentration of 0 0.800 molar, and after 20 minutes, the concentration is down to 0 0.259 molar. What's the half-life of this reaction? To find the half-life, we'll use this equation. It's the only equation we know so far that has half-life in it. But unfortunately, in order to use it, we need to know k, the rate constant. How can we find out what k is? Luckily, we learned another equation for first-order reactions, and this one will allow us to figure out k. Our problem tells us the beginning and ending concentrations, and the amount of time, so we'll be able to use this equation to get k. First, we plug in our values. Notice that I left the time in minutes, 
In previous problems, we had our time in seconds, but it's okay to use any unit of time. Seconds, minutes, or even years. The only thing to watch out for is that whatever unit you use, you'll need to use the same unit in your value for k. So, we'll solve the left side first. Remember to calculate the fraction before you take the logarithm. The fraction is equal to 3.09, and when we take the logarithm, we get 1.128. Solving for k gives us 0.0564 minutes to the minus 1. Now we can use this value for k in our other equation in order to figure out the half-life. When we do, we get a half-life of 12.3 minutes. And that brings us to the age of the Earth, which I mentioned at the beginning of the video. It turns out that many kinds of minerals in the Earth contain radioactive elements, like uranium. As we'll see later in this course, when an element emits radiation, the result is usually a different isotope. So, for example, the most common type of radioactivity in uranium causes it to become the element thorium. It turns out that this is a first-order process, just like the chemical reactions we've been looking at. So, we can use the same equations to study radioactivity. That's exactly what Bertram Boltwood did in 1907. He studied several different minerals that contain uranium from around the world. By looking at the amount of uranium and thorium in the rocks, he was able to figure out T, the amount of time the radioactivity had been going on. That told him how old the rocks were. What he found out was that the oldest rocks he had were about 2.2 billion years old. That was much longer than anyone realized that the Earth had existed. Today, we've discovered rocks that are even older, over 4 billion years old, in places like central Australia. But Boltwood's work was the first proof we had that the Earth was billions of years old, and we still use some of the same methods that were pioneered by him in order to find the ages of rocks now. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll talk more about what we can learn about first-order reactions, and we'll also start looking at the other most common type of reaction, which is second-order. I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week!